Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Isam Mikhail. I'm one of the pulmonary rig care physicians and also uh, interventional pulmonology. So I will be talking today about uh, the role of interventional pulmonologists and in the intensive care unit. So the purpose of this study, uh, this talk is talk about how we do things uh, or how we treat, say, massive hemopsis or all that stuff. I just to, to talk about the um, the services that we can provide in the intensive care unit mainly. Uh, nothing to disclose. So I'll be talking about bronchial management of massive uh, bronchoscopic management of uh, massive hemoptysis, central airway, airway obstruction, medical management of empyema, uh, uh, tracheostomy in the ICU, and management of uh, bronchopleural fistula. So we'll talk. Start with hemoptysis. So hemoptysis is coughing up blood from the um, lungs or the main uh, bronchial airways. And uh, the definition of hemoptysis is debatable and controversial in, in the um, literature uh, between mild, se moderate, severe, uh, massive, or life-threatening. Sometimes you see it only as massive and non-massive. So um, non-massive hemoptysis is a um, uh, very small amount of uh, um, coughing up blood. However, massive hemoptysis is basically a life-threatening condition. So um, how would we uh, manage those patients in the intensive care unit? Uh, airway protection, if the patient is presenting with a massive hemoptysis, you'll probably need to protect the airway, intubate them as, as soon as possible, fluid resuscitation, and some of them rarely when they require blood transfusion. Uh, it's very rarely if uh, when a patient coughs up blood to the point that they need blood transfusion. You only need about 150 ml of uh, blood in the airways for the patient actually to uh, asphyxiate and kind of die. So uh, 100, uh, 150 ml would not require blood transfusion. So you have to be aware of that. And once after intubation, we usually place the patients in lateral decubitus position with the bleeding side down. And how can we tell the bleeding side without, if, if you do a, a quick bronchoscopy, you can be able to tell, or maybe a, a, do an X-ray or a CAT scan, you might find a mass or a lesion on the, say, right side and would be right side down. Uh, reverse coagulation disorders are possible, and um, we can do bronchoscopic measures. IR consults for embolization if that fails or very rarely we call uh, cardiothoracic surgery for, um, uh, th their role would be very limited to probably surgical resection of that part of the lung if other measures fail. So I would um, divide um, the, 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 the ways that we treat hemopsis, a few, few things. Number one is if the patient has an endobronchial lesion versus if the patient does not have endobronchial lesion. So the things that we have is a rigid or flexible bronchoscopy, um, we use hot therapies uh, like in the uh, laser, argon plasma coagulation, electrocautery. Sometimes we use balloon tamponade and vasoconstrictive agents as well. So as I mentioned, I'll divide hemopsis into two scenarios. One, if the patient has an endobronchial lesion, something like this, what we see in the picture right here. So that's kind of a little bit easy to manage. Why? Because we have uh, modalities or techniques to treat that like laser, argon plasma, we can also use uh, a balloon tamponade and uh, electrocautery. So NDIAG laser is effective and bronchoscopically visible source mechanism. It causes photocoagulation of the bleeding mucosa and then um, causes hemostasis. This is a case of uh, renal cell carcinoma metastasizing into the right main stem bronchus and we're using um, YAP laser here for that uh, re reason. Argan plasma on the um, other uh, side, it's uh, non-contact thermal uh, methods for uh, hemostasis, effective and as I mentioned, visibly uh, bronchoscopic lesions. That technology uses argon gas to deliver plasma of evenly distributed uh, thermal energy to causes uh, photocoagulation and causes hemostasis. Other uh, methods of hot therapies, we use um, uh, electrocautery, such as uh, hot snare right here, cautery snare or uh, knives or a hot probe. That also causes uh, hemostasis and can stop the bleeding. If we don't have an end, if the patient does not have an endobronchial lesion, for example, this patient here presenting with uh, bleeding from the right upper lobe doesn't have any endo endobronchial lesions. Uh, unfortunately, we have only limited uh, options. We can use vasoconstrictive agents such as epinephrine. That's one. Two is we can use endobronchial blocker or balloon tamponade. Um, and if that does not stop the bleeding, then we send the patient to IR for embolization. 
This is an endobronchial blocker. What we use is a three-way uh, adapter, and uh, we connect the mechanical ventilator from here. And then this is the um, a blocker right here, and this is the bronchoscope. And that, by doing that, we guide the endobronchial blocker into the sleeve inside, and we inflate the balloon, and we cause tamponade. And we usually leave it in place for about 24 hours, and then we uh, uh, do another bronchoscopy in about 24 hours to make sure there is no bleeding stops, and then we um, take the endobronchial blocker out and uh, investigate the source of bleeding, and we go from there. This is a balloon tamponade in the right main stem, bronchus right here for bleeding. <coughs> I'll switch gears to a central airway obstruction. And uh, it's a rare condition that we have patients that be admitted to the ICU for central airway obstruction. But however, those patients are critically ill and sometimes difficult to manage, difficult to intubate, uh, especially if they have um, uh, severe vena cava uh, obstruction. Um, laying this patient's flat might be difficult, giving them sedations or paralytics, they might code on the table. I'm not going to talk about that, but I'll talk about bronchoscopic management of central airway obstruction. So the definition of that is, is um, obstruction of the airflow in the trachea or the main stem bronchi. This could be benign or malignant etiologies, and it can be life-threatening. If you see a patient like this presenting with a right main stem bronchus mass that's extending into the main trachea, and this is after treatment, you can see this is the tip of the rigid bronchoscope. So those patients would be hypoxic and uh, presenting sometimes with stridorous uh, sounds and um, complaining of shortness of breath, they might not be able to lay flat. So what we have, the same thing is that we also have for uh, treating uh, hemopsis with endobronchial lesions. We, have, we can do rigid bronchoscope with debridement or uh, coring out the tumor. Hot therapies like in the YAG or YAP laser, argon plasma coagulation, electrocolory, or cold therapies like cryotherapy, balloon dilation, and airway stenting. Some, most of the time, we use combinations of these. The good thing about the cryotherapy is um, it's a cold therapy, so it does not need, for the laser and argon plasma, you need to have the FIA2 usually below 40%. With the cryotherapy, you don't have to have that. So if your patient is very sick in the intensive care unit on 80, 90% of oxygen, we can use cryotherapy without having to lower the FIA2 down, if possible. Uh, this is a patient that actually presented to our hospital in uh, February of this year. He presented actually with shortness of breath. He is known to have uh, lung cancer, shortness of breath, and had stridor's uh, sounds. He was actually thought to have um, laryngeal edema, was given uh, racemic KP in the emergency department without improvement, got a CAT scan that showed uh, tracheal mass. Um, he was uh, actually maintained, I think, um, uh, our colleagues here know about this guy, maintained on high flow and got heliox in the, at night, and um, still about 80, 90% obstruction of the trachea. So just actually just we brought this uh, patient in the endoscopy suite. To intubate this patient was very difficult to maintain his oxygenations and make sure the patient also, no paralytics during intubation, make sure the patient does not code, does not lo lose the muscle tone during intubation. But what we did for this patient is um, we used multiple uh, modalities. This is um, a cautery snare right here. This is organ plasma coagulation. So we did not, for laser, we have to take the patient to the OR you have to get, give them a notice about 24 hours in advance. So this um, argon plasma is an alternative to the laser therapy and uh, can be done at the bedside in the intensive care unit or in endoscopy suite. Our GI colleagues use this to treat uh, gastric ulcers or bleeding ulcers. And um, uh, we did balloon dilation. And this is the picture at, um, at the end of the case. It's almost all the tumor is done. Uh, we went from almost 90 80-90% to the tumor completely gone, and this patient was um, discharged out of the hospital in a few days. This uh, uh, study was done by Henry Colt. It uh, was actually published, pu published back in the 90s, and, and the main thing was therapeutic rigid bronchoscopy allows level of care changes in patients with acute respiratory failure from central airway obstruction. So at that time, most of the laser was only used, being used on the rigid bronchoscopy because all of those equipments were very large, so could not fit in the flexible bronchoscope. However, right now, um, laser, argon plasma, and cryo 
all can fit in the small flexible bronchoscope. So basically, all we're trying to say is if you end up having one of those patients in the intensive care unit, central airway obstruction with a right main stem bronchus or left main stem or the trachea, um, maybe we can give it a try and do um, uh, tumor debulking. If you look at patients who undergo uh, radiation and chemotherapy, we give them maybe a year or two or, or a few months. And right now with the immunotherapy and target therapy, they live longer, maybe three, four years, but a lot of side effects from the immune therapy or chemotherapy, but we achieve a picture like this in about an hour and a half or two hours uh, in the bronchoscopy and, and they live longer. And he did not need a stent. After um, debulking, there was no need for a stent. Next, I'll talk about medical management of empyema. So every once in a while, you get a patient that gets admitted to the hospital with uh, maybe a septic shock, pneumonia. CAT scan shows a uh, luxated, uh, complicated pleural effusion. You do an ultrasound um, that shows complicated, septated pleural effusion. You do a chest tube at the bedside, get a purulent, uh, purulent fluid um, aspirated out. So of course, treatment, you're treating a septic shock with uh, antibiotics and all that stuff, but you know that this, uh, this patient either needs VATS with decortication or um, uh, some other measures. So I'll talk about the medical treatment and, and some other hospitals, they, this is what they start first, treating the patients with DNA, uh, TPA and DNAs, and then if the patient fails, the patient goes to the OR, and they usually have thoracic surgery from the get-go, seeing the patients and all that stuff. Some other places, they take the patient to the OR immediately. So it depends from one place to another. So that was based on a study done by uh, Rahman uh, that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2011. He used a, a combination of TPA and DNAs, and that study had four arms, TPA alone, DNAs alone, TPA and DNAs, and, and double placebo. So at the end, the uh, double uh, DNAs and, and uh, TPA showed improved drainages, reduced surgical referral, and reduced duration of hospital stay. So this is something you keep in your mind if you get one of those patients in the intensive care unit, might not be a surgical candidate, or uh, you wanted to try medical management first. Uh, we give TP and DNA. Sometimes the patient cannot go to the OR until like three, four days or something, or the patient is, is sick, on pressures, then this is what we can try in the intensive care unit. And they might get better on this, or they might still need to go to the OR, but at least this is a temporary measure that can um, bridge them to the OR. And we get asked that question, small versus large chest tube, why would you place a 14 French Wayne chest tube, not uh, a 32 French or 28 French or a 24 French uh, for an empyema? So missed one study uh, done looking at comparing chest tubes and would that uh, impair the drainage? Will that impair the referral for surgery? Or would that change the outcome if you use a small chest tube versus a large chest tube? Um, results came back favoring using a small chest tube. So uh, pain scores are higher in larger surgically placed chest tubes. However, small guided wire inserted chest tubes, which is like the wind that we use in the intensive care unit, causes less pain, did not impair clinical outcomes. However, it's very important to um, remind the nursing staff to flush the small bore chest tube with 30 ml every six hours. And uh, the chest tube can be uh, removed once uh, the x-ray gets better or the drainage is 700 or 50 ml based on your criteria. I'll talk about the percutaneous uh, dilational tracheostomy, that service that we provide in the intensive care unit. So perc trach or percutaneous dilational um, tracheostomy is a, a bedside tracheostomy, minimally invasive. It's being done in the intensive care unit at the patient's uh, bedside. Different kits are available, but the one that we use is the Blue Rhino. And the question that you might ask, why would I refer my patient to you um, to do a tracheostomy at the bedside versus in the OR? Is it better to be, is it, isn't that better to be done in the OR? Or um, complications might be higher here or there. So basically, multiple studies done in the past looking at complications, looking at which is better, surgical uh, tracheostomy versus uh, percutaneous dilation and tracheostomy. So Simon uh, published a study in critical care in 2013, systematic review of uh, 45 uh, studies with 24,000 uh, cases. Mortality rate was 0.17%, sorry. 
and uh, complications rates are uh, range from one to 20%. However, major complications are rare. Most of the complications are minor bleeding and difficult cannulation. Same thing uh, in a, a study that was published in 2006, uh, uh, 17 randomized controlled trial with 1,200 pa uh, 12, uh, 1, patients. Same thing, PDT had lower clinical significant wound infection. Uh, PDT was equivalent to ST in bleeding and mortality. And subgroup actually, um, percutaneous elation trichostomy had less bleeding than the surgical trichostomy. Um, so it's the, the procedure of choice when you have someone that can do it. And um, instead of transferring the patient to the OR and getting reports and all of that stuff, and some of the patients have lines and all of that, they might be critically ill. So it's better to be done at the bedside if it can be done. Of course, there are some contraindications and most of those contraindications can apply to surgical tracheostomy as well. Um, the only things that we would prefer for the patient to have the surgery done on the OR if the patient received radiation to the neck before. Uh, prior tracheostomy is not an absolute contraindication, but it can be done on the bedside as well. Um, patients with uh, different anatomy, like we got consulted once for a patient who had a transposition of the great vessels and had surgery as a, as a kid. So we referred that patient to the OR, just to be on the safe side. We're not really sure exactly what happens with the blood vessels in the neck area. This is just to confirm um, less wound infection with percutaneous sarcostomy, less bleeding, and less mortality. My last topic is I'll talk about the endobronchial valves for the treatment of bronchopleural fistula. So FDA approved uh, endobronchial valves for, uh, in, uh, for uh, bronchopleural fistula a long time ago. They were also approved at one point of time for treatment of emphysema. And then that was withdrawn, was on hold because there was no significant improvement. Right now, it was approved for emphysema as well uh, in June of last year, June of 2018. So what happens with uh, bronchopleural fistula? You have someone has uh, a pneumothorax here. And when we take a breath, air goes down, uh, trachea, left main stem, for example, into the lungs. And then if you have a pneumothorax here, air goes into the pleura and you if you have a chest tube, into the chest tube, and then the pleural back, and this is what you see as a continuous air. That tells you that there is that tells you that there is a, a bronchopleural fistula, and and sometimes it's difficult to ventilate those patients because you're losing a lot of volume through the pneumothorax here. So what we do is, um, if we can block air from going into that segment of the lung, and then we give it some time for the pleural, for the fistula to heal. So by placing a valve here, we are redirecting the air into the healthier lung, and then we're giving some time for this fistula to heal, and then the air leak stops. And this is how we find out about where the air leak is coming from. We go in with a catheter inflated, and we look at the air leak, if the air leak stops or decreases, then we know that it's coming from this segment or that segment. Most of the time, it's usually coming from two segments or so, because the lungs are coming again into each other. And uh, this is how the valve looks like. And this is my last slide. <laughs> do, you, do you guys have any questions? 